Okay. So uh, we're discussing here a cluster of themes, as you may know. We're discussing the theme, thematic cluster of chosen people, people of God. Where does that leave everybody else, both in the here and now? Where does that leave everybody else in the ultimate future, right? In the in the end of days. These are the cluster of themes that we're looking at this week. Uh, so we spoke about the Jewish side of things, the Hebrew Bible legacy, uh, the vision of the end of days, and so on. We discussed those things, and when the Hebrew Bible, and then Judaism, and now today we look at Hebrew Bible and Christianity. Okay, uh, these are enormous topics, and the texts are much contested how to, for their interpretation. So as usual, I'm just going to try to give the big picture here in the hope that some of you will be interested to actually look at the passages carefully or closely. So, let's begin with Jesus. In all four Gospels, Jesus acts primarily, interacts primarily with Jews. And this is worth stating, right? Jesus is not in Norway, right? Jesus is in Judea. Therefore, the people with whom he interacts are, not exclusively, but mostly Judeans. And Judeans are mostly, not exclusively, but mostly Jews, i.e. they belong to the ethnos, the ethnicity of Judeans, of Jews, the descent group, which we spoke about on Wednesday. They observe, they, uh, observe the laws of the Torah, or they're supposed to, and they worship the God whose temple is in Jerusalem. These are Jesus' people. They are the same people who are his opponents. They are the same people who are his admirers and followers. The same people who provide the human resources for the crowds that he attracts, as well as those people who are attacking him. All of them are equally Judeans, Jews, <coughs> Jews. This point is often forgotten as if somehow only his opponents are Jews and those who follow him aren't. But the narratives make no such statement, right? It's, it's understood this is his setting. And, or differently, these are his people. <coughs> Except for an occasional Greek, to use the word used in the Gospels, Greek means a pagan. In other words, would be a pagan, would be a later term, or a polytheist. That's, or, there are occasional Greeks who pop in, and of course, Romans, Roman soldiers, Roman administrators, right, and so and so on. The next big point to remind you of uh, Mr. Enslin's reading from several weeks back. At no point do any of the Gospels claim that Jesus is intending to found a new religion. Jesus is intending to found a new people. Jesus is intending to set aside Judaism and bring about something else. Okay? In other words, I'm not denying something the Gospels say. I'm simply observing this is something the Gospels don't say. Okay? We all understand where we're going with this story, what will, what will happen. Right, but that's not the way the Gospels themselves present Jesus. <clears throat> In the small print, I gave you some uh, two of the most pointed passages that often have been understood this way. But uh, read the passages in context. I don't think they mean Jesus is pushing aside Jews and Judaism. Jesus is attacking Jewish leadership authority, or Jewish leadership groups, authority groups, which of course he does. He's a prophetic figure who is a, who is a critic of society and a critic of the institutions of society. The priesthood, scribes, Pharisees, uh, the temple, the temple worship, that's what a prophet does. A prophet criticizes the authority figures of society, and that's what Jesus does as well. He is no more founding a new religion thereby than was Jeremiah. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about Jesus right now. If you're interested, come and take my course, should I ever get around to offering it, on the uh, introduction to the New Testament, the earliest Christianity. By the way, a plug for my new book, right? The Jewish Annotated New Testament just came out. Got an article in the New York Times. I was mentioned by name, <laughs> right? The uh, New York Times. Anyway, so Jewish Annotated New Testament. Jews are taking over the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Okay. <laughs> so you may want to look at it. Okay, enough about Jesus. Now about Paul. Again, we could spend weeks talking about these things, but again, we're not going to. Uh, so talk about Paul. Paul is, the, is, I would say, is the key figure here, is the key transitional uh, figure. Because Paul is the one who argues that the new people of God is no longer a descent group. Right. Paul is arguing that Israel is the people of God, but 
every, every word I'm about to say is argued about, right? It's how you had to formulate this, and there are hundreds of footnotes on the following sentence. But Paul is the one who argues that the people of God, or perhaps the new people of God, or perhaps I should say Israel, or perhaps I should say Israel of God, right? Uh, that group is not identical with the old descent group of Israel, Judeans, Jews. Because the real Israel, or to use a phrase he uses only once, the Israel of God consists of those who believe in Christ. And that is the new people of God. And in turn, that people, of course, is not an ethnos, it's not a descent group, it's not ethnicity, it's something else. That's Paul. There's a famous line in Galatians, which I quote for you here, which I ask you to look at, uh, 328-29, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. <coughs> it's a beautiful line, very striking, very striking line. Exactly what does it mean, I ask you? Uh, I'm not completely sure, but I know it sounds good, but I'm not completely sure, after all, is it true there is no longer male and female? Last I checked, Christians come in two varieties, male and female, last I checked, and male and female are still males and females, doing what males and females do. So what does Paul mean when he says there is no longer male and female? The biological reality continues. So we need to interpret it. Therefore, what does it mean then when he says there are no longer Jew or Greek? Well, not so simple anymore, right? This is actually very, very complicated. Uh, but I think what he's getting at is the point of these distinctions. These distinctions may persist socially, i.e., there are Jews and there are Greeks. There are males and there are females, just as there are free and slaves. These social distinctions still obtain. They still work. They're still real. But in the eyes of Christ, these distinctions no longer matter. That's at least how I, Shia Cohen, understand what Paul is getting at in this, in this line. Feel free to disagree. Right, so he is not, he's not arguing there aren't any Jews anymore. Jews still exist, but that distinction between Jew and Gentile is what no longer really matters in God's eyes. Because he's replacing the descent group with what we ultimately will call a religion. That's Paul, right? And that's big. That's really big. Okay, that's not Jesus, that's Paul. Okay, I'm not going to stop for questions because you might ask me one. <laughs> and then we're going to be in trouble, right? Uh, I say again, these are immensely contested questions about how to interpret what Paul actually means. Paul is a tremendously effective writer, a tremendously effective preacher. Uh, he's, not such a, he's not an effective theologian, right? A theologian has a system clearly worked out, everything fits, all the pieces fit together, and it's all laid out from part one to part two to part three as you proceed logically through the system. That's not Paul. That's what modern interpreters want Paul to be, but alas, he is not. Instead, he's a speaker, a teacher, a man full of emotion and passion. Anyway. Okay, any questions? Good. So, um, uh, seriously, um, yeah, what can I do? Uh, anybody want to ask a question? <laughs> right, so if, Professor Cohen, what are you saying? Are you saying that Paul is the real founder of Christianity, not Jesus? Is that what you're saying, Professor Cohen? Um, yeah. All right, this view has been out there a long time, and people, of course, argue about this very point. I would say, yeah, it's Paul who's the, the main man here. Yeah, this is how I, Shai, Cohen understand things. A lot of us people out there disagree, have different contest suggestions, different formulations, so feel free to disagree with what Professor Shai Cohen thinks. This is just how I understand things. Okay.
Wait, I do have a question about that. Aha, uh -huh, any, yes. What about, you said Paul was the founder of the church. What about, wasn't um, Peter, the apostle, didn't say Jesus, didn't Jesus say Peter, like, you're the rock on which I'll build my church, so. He did. And if you go to the, uh, if you go to Vatican City and go to St. Peter's Cathedral, there is that inscription written all the way around the dome, right? It's right there, that's the spot. Yeah, so, uh, so Jesus says he wants to build a, build a church, so. Yeah, the problem is that we don't have the letter to the Romans and the letter to the Galatians written by Peter. Assuming he wrote such letters. We have those written by Paul. And those written by Paul have had an enormous influence on the shaping of Christianity. Do we know what Peter thought? Peter had no, because Peter is only a figure in the book of Acts, and in the Gospels, of course, and then in the book of Acts, and also he, he's mentioned a few times in Paul's letters, most famously in chapter 2 of Galatians, the famous scene of Peter coming to Antioch, uh, where he accuses Peter of not acting properly. So Paul and Peter were not always on the best of terms. Yes? Uh, question, what about First and Second Peter? What about First and Second Peter? Oh, what about they mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this guy, I mean, as far as literature and his name, yeah, but those, those are small letters. Okay. Those letters don't have the same power of Galatians, Romans, Corinthians, which are big letters. Those are small. Right? It's hard to build a rock on those letters. Build, build a church on those letters, right? Okay. Anyway, let's move along. As I said, this, these are big questions. Okay. So back to, where, back to where I was. Back to where I was. So, questions then. If this be true in Paul's eyes, then Paul has two very large and difficult questions to address. One in the letter to the Romans. What is the status of the Jews the members of that ethnic group, that descent group, of which Paul himself is a member, of which Jesus had been a member, right? What is the status of Jews who do not believe in Christ? Who do not share the new dispensation? Where are they? How do they fit into the new divine economy? What's their place in the map of the new map of the world? That's the question that Paul grapples with in Romans, especially chapter 2, and also most famously those last three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, that I ask you to look at. But I know these are very difficult things to read, but at least have to be, at least look at them, right? Where Paul is grappling with, with, this set of, with this question. The other question is, if there is no longer a Jew and Gentile in Christ, because our salvation comes not through the descent group of Christ, that presumably would imply, rather through Christ, that would suggest that salvation comes not through the Torah, and indeed, that's what Paul says. That's what Paul says in Galatians. So where does that leave the Torah, the revelation from God, the commandments? Where does that leave us? That's the subject of Galatians. And needless to say, on these two very difficult questions, right, Paul has not given the, what shall we say, the clearest, simplest of answers, which explains why scholars to this very day debate and argue about what exactly does Paul mean. In any case, I want to focus uh, here on, those, uh, on these two points in, uh, in Romans. So the descent group. Israel remains a descent group. Israel remains the peoplehood. They are Israelites. They are the sonship, glory, covenants, giving of the law, the worship, the promises, the patriarchs. And from them, according to the flesh, is Christ. So Paul recognizes that the Jewish people, the Jews, Israel, use his language, remains Israel after the flesh. They are the people of God. They have, what shall we say, history on their side. They have the Torah. They have the covenant. You can't deny it. There it is. On the other hand, we have the new Israel, which is Israel of faith, or I'm calling achievement. Remember on Wednesday I spoke about the same two poles in rabbinic thinking. Right? Israel is a descent group. That's ascription. With the same token, we accept Gentiles to convert. That's achievement. That's by faith. Here we have the same tension. Israel is after the flesh, but not all who are from Israel are Israel, and not all of Abraham's children are seed, but through Isaac shall they call your seed. So, for Paul then, the old Israel is being pushed aside by a new Israel. Uh, the Israel after the flesh is not the same as Israel after the spirit. <coughs> So, what does that mean, class? Does that mean that, quote, has God rejected his people? By no means. 
about the, 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 the. Here I would say Paul is caught. Logically, of course, Paul should say, is God rejected his people? Yes! That's what he should say, because Israel has rejected God, or Israel is no longer clued in to the change in the divine economy to the divine map. So Paul should conclude, yes, Israel has been rejected. But of course, Paul cannot bring himself to say that, perhaps because Paul is a Jew himself. The result is he gets these extraordinary <coughs> twists and turns, which again rhetorically are very effective, even if you try to map out or outline his answer later on, after you've read it, you will realize you'll scratch your head and realize I don't understand what he's talking about. Precisely. By no means, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Had they stumbled so as to fall? By no means, of course not. But through their stumbling, salvation came to the Gentiles. Anyway, I don't have time to work through this now. Uh, in any case, I'm just indicating that for Paul, the question of the status of the people of Israel in the new age, new dispensation, reigns a puzzle. Right? It sends out very conflicting signals. He's much less conflicted about the Torah, because he is now absolutely convinced that salvation, or being put right with God, the term he uses is justification, being put right with God, is no longer a function of the Torah and the commandments, but rather is a function of faith in Christ. At that point, he's pretty unequivocal. But the status of Israel, Jews, in the New Age, on that point, he is completely equivocal. That's Paul. That's all I'm going to say about Paul. Unless somebody has a question or an observation. Right. Just a brief aside for a second. When in the 1960s, the Second Vatican Council set about its task of trying to re reconfigure, reconsider how the Church, the Catholic Church, relates to non-Catholics in the world, among them Jews, right, for the reconsideration of Jews, the biblical passage on which they based their reconsideration was Romans 9 to 11. But has God rejected his people? By no means. There you've got it. Right? And that was the passage which became the scriptural basis for Catholic reconsideration of what's about the Jews. Yes, Eddie. So we talked about last time how if you were like a Jew, if you were one of the chosen people, it was kind of better than being a convert to Judaism? Yeah, I mean, Jews are allowed to make their own rules, so we do rank a little higher than those who, yeah, right? Yeah, so if you were a Jew who then kind of converted to Christianity, does that mean that like puts you on the top top of the pile since you were already the chosen people? All right, well, problem is, first okay. problem is what verb to use, right? Does a Jew convert to Christianity in Paul's eyes? I'm not sure that's the right verb to use. It might, I'm not sure what verb to use, but all right. Let's, Re let's, recognize Christ as the... Right. Then for Paul, then you are the same apparently in Paul's eyes as a Gentile, a blue-blooded pagan from Corinth, right, who has been eating food sacrificed to idols all his life and has been uh, otherwise engaged in fornication and sin and has now been possessed by the spirits that are acknowledging the truth of God, uh, namely through Christ. Uh, apparently you and this pagan, you, Jew, ethnically Jew, and you, ethnic Greek, pagan, Gentile, you apparently rank the same. There is no longer Jew or Greek. So then all special status is just kind of lost at once? Is it just like... Yeah. I, I, does Paul say this as explicitly as I am? Does he acknowledge this as black and white, unambiguously as I am? No, he does not. But I think that's what he means, even though he can't quite bring himself to say it. Was there some kind of like deterioration of the status, you know? Or was it just like, as soon as Christ came, it was like... Well, that's, yeah, well, you have, there, there, there are three stages in the world, right? There's the world before Christ, then there's the time when Christ was here, then there's the time after Christ. Okay, Jews don't acknowledge this. Jews just think there's the time the Torah has been in the world, the time before the Torah, the time after the Torah. What more is there to say? Right, but for Christians, and, and for Paul, clearly, I think, but certainly in the book of Acts, you have three stages. Before Christ, the time of Christ, and then after Christ. And that's the way I, my analogy is the map of the world, according to Paul, has been changed. God has redrawn the ethnic social map of the world. Jews don't acknowledge this. They still think there are Jews and Gentiles in Paul's eyes. But Paul says, no, the map of the world has been changed. 
Yes, B, you look like you're going to plots, as we say, where I come from. <laughs> I, I was under the impression that Paul was very clear that Jewish Christians needed to continue to follow the law, and Gentile Christians, of course, did not. Okay, uh, B observes that Paul thinks that Jewish Jews who believe in Christ need to continue to observe the law. That is a much contested, much debated proposition. I happen to agree with it that all of Paul's attacks against the observance of the law, most famously against circumcision in the, in the letter to the Galatians, upon which I wrote annotations in the Jewish annotated New Testament, <coughs> which I refer you for a brilliant exposition of the text, right? Back to, back to where I was, all those, all those Pauline attacks on circumcision, observance of the law, and so on, they're all directed to Gentiles. Right, his audience are Gentiles. Namely, asking them, exhorting them, encouraging them, please, 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 don't become circumcised. Please, 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 don't think that you will attain salvation with God through observance of the Torah. That's not how we do it anymore. But what would Paul say to the audience of Jews? He would say to them, have faith in Christ, of course, he would say, right? Believe, believe in Christ, of course, he would say. What he say to Jews, well, now you can, you know, you can go to the mall on Saturday afternoon if you want and eat white bread during Passover and, uh, you know, f uh, eat lobster and, you know, finally break out, you know. Is that what he would say to Jews? Or he would say to them, no, 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 keep observing the Sabbath and the food laws and everything else, but also add to it faith in Christ. Not substitute, but add. Is that what he would say? Well, the new post-Vatican II, post-Holocaust ecumenical Paul is that one. Right, Paul talking to Jews would tell Jews, you keep observing the Torah, but understand that the full fulfillment is through Christ, which is added to, put upon, the top of observance of the Torah. Gentiles don't have to, because they're Gentiles. Paul is nowhere says explicitly, clearly, unambiguously, what I just said. All right? The old Paul was, he was setting aside the Torah for everybody. That's the pre-Holocaust poll. All right, once again, we're swimming in very deep waters now. So I'm going to get out of the pool. <laughs> to mix metaphors. Um, okay. Somebody here should give a course on New Testament and early Christianity. I mean, that's clear, right? I think undergraduates need such a course. Well, no one else is doing it. I might do it. Okay, questions? Okay, let's now go to our friend Justin. Unlike Paul, Justin was born a Gentile, a Greek. So if Shia Cohen is correct in his armchair psychoanalysis that Paul is somewhat conflicted about these matters because he himself is a Jew, sees himself as a Jew, no, and nowhere claims not to be a Jew. On the contrary, in this famous passage in Philippians, he loudly proclaims his Jewish uh, credentials. And consequently, Paul is conflicted about how exactly to explain how Jews have the ball, but they lost the ball, they dropped the ball, they fumbled, but they didn't fumble. There are God's people still, but they're not. Right? So Paul is you know, sort of caught twixt and tween. Justin is not worried, does not suffer from these ambiguities. For Justin, a century after Paul, a Greek, he can say flat out, Jews had the ball, well, I'll follow that metaphor, they fumbled, they lost, they're out. Period. So here we find the, again, the doctrine of supersessionism very explicitly. Right, where Christianity supersedes Judaism. That word appears on the next page on the handout. Okay, so what do we see in Justin? Justin is very explicit. They're not going to read the passages. They're all there very clearly for you. We Christians are the children of Abraham. We are God's holy people. We are God's chosen people. When Isaiah talks about Israel in the end of days, he's talking about us. They have us Christians. And again, not about you, right? It's understood. This is, you know, it's not ecumenical discourse here. It's not both of us. Why don't we play nicely together? No, no, no. Us, not you. Okay, therefore he says, just as you once upon a time were called Jacob and Israel and everything else, now it's we who are called Jacob, Israel, and everything else. Okay, I'm not going to these passages, blah, blah, blah. Um, for Justin, Christians do have a peoplehood. I already mentioned that Justin has this very odd millennial view, um, view of Christian millennialism, where he thinks the end of days... Christ will rebuild the city of Jerusalem and will there reign in glory for a thousand year reign. 
which sounds awfully like a Jewish view of the end of days, as I already commented. Right, so Justin still has some notion of Christian peoplehood, as if Christians are going to rule, not in some heavenly Jerusalem, not in some metaphoric Jerusalem, not in some allegorical, symbolic Jerusalem or Zion. No, the real city of Jerusalem. So this is very odd. This is <coughs> odd, given everything else. But Justin still has that. But in any case, for most Christians, of course, these things are all symbolic, metaphorical, right? Christians are the new chosen people, as Justin says. Christians are the God's, God's Israel, as Justin says. They are Jacob and Israel, all those terms. All the promises that apply to the end of days apply to us Christians. All the glorious future described in scripture belong to us Christians. But for most Christians, right, these views, of course, are understood to be uh, not the actual literal city of Jerusalem, not the actual literal holy land, these are meant to be metaphors or symbols. Zion, as I discussed briefly on uh, Monday. Justin, on this point, has something odd. I'm not quite sure why he's got this, this actual millennial kingdom of God in the city of Jerusalem. But OK, there it is. I can't quite figure it out. Uh, he's got a bunch of biblical typologies backing this up, uh, which we have the rejected child, the beloved child, and of course for Justin it's very obvious the beloved child is us, Christians, the rejected child in these typologies is you, you Jews. Needless to say, when Jews read those same biblical stories and the same typology, they accepted this typology, but reversed. So. Who is Jacob and who is Esau? Jacob, the beloved son, Esau, the problematic son. Which one is which? Well, if you're a Christian, it's obvious, right? We Jews are Jacob, uh, we, we Christians are Jacob, and you Jews are Esau. And if you are a Jew, it's just as obvious. We Jews are Jacob, and you Christians are Esau. It's very clear, it's very simple. But of course, it's completely the opposite, one, the other. Yes, Eddie. Do you really? I guess Jacob's chosen, but do you really want to be Jacob? Because doesn't Jacob be like a deceiver? And Jacob kind of. Uh, all right. I say you went to Sunday school. I, I see that. Yes. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yes. Uh, if you actually read the narratives, not just in the abstract, but actually read the stories, you see that uh, the narrator has a narrator whom we we in the Bible biz call J, but the narr but the narrator in the book of Genesis, let's call him Moses, right? Um, has extraordinary sympathy for Esau. And he's depicted as a very sympathetic uh, character, as if you know his younger, smarter brother you know, runs circles around him, and poor Esau winds up with nothing when Jacob sort of grabs everything. And Jacob is not entirely an admirable figure, uh, the way the narrator is described. Even though the narrator, surely, the narrator is a member of the people of Israel who see themselves as descended from Jacob, not from Esau. So there's extraordinary uh, uh, work of the narrator to take the figure whom we know in advance is the loser and somehow it makes him a sympathetic figure and Jacob is not always admirable. He's a trickster figure. The trickster heroes are not always admirable heroes. They're tricksters. Uh, yes, you put your finger on an interesting problem. That did not bother later Jews and Christians for whom it was very obvious that Jacob is the bearer of the covenant, the founder of the people of Israel. Jacob is Israel. His 12 sturdy sons provide the 12 tribes. Right? It's, it's our, our plane ticket is on Jacob's plane. And Esau was going to go wander off to Idumea somewhere and be Esau. Mm -hmm. Go hunt wild animals. All right, that's Esau. Right. Okay. So that's something to talk about when we take your course on the intro of the, new, new the Hebrew Bible, is the amazing skill and artistry of the narrator of the book of, of the Genesis. Right, of able to bring out sympathy even for the character you know is the quote, not the hero, the anti-hero. Okay, good. You paid attention in Sunday school, Annie. That's good. Okay, I think I'm ready now to my big points. Christianity versus Judaism. I'm up to that. Is that we up to there on the, on the screen? Christianity versus Judaism. So, questions uh, on these things? So read Justin. Justin is about as politically incorrect as can be on this point. Especially for post-Holocaust Christians who are trying hard to be nice to Jews, Justin is a problematic text. Okay, let's not talk about Christianity versus Judaism, their view of the world themselves vis-a-vis -vis others. So, the Jewish view of the world is a bipolar one. 
right? It's dualistic. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. I would argue the Christian view of the world is more or less the same thing. There are Christians and there are what Paul calls Greeks, which means Gentiles, i.e. non-Christians, non-Christians. The major difference, there are two major differences in this, bi, these two bipolar view of the world. One is that Jews see themselves as an ethnic group, Christians do not, and second of all, there are around 12 million Jews in the world, and there are around 1 billion Christians in the world, which perhaps makes the Jewish view a little bit harder to, to accept. I mean, please, really, really? And the whole rest of the world is all the same? Doesn't make terribly much sense. But this is why typically the way a minority group will look at a world. Right? I mean, Albanians look at the world also. There are Albanians and there are non-Albanians. That, you know, that's really all you need to know. Right? So uh, this is a typical way for a minority to view the world. So. I know there are only 12 or 15 million Jews in the world, not very much, but hey, that's how they look at the world. Minorities do regularly. Next bullet point. Christians saw and see themselves as the new chosen people. This is our friend Justin. Right? We are Israel. We Christians are Israel. We are God's chosen people. We are the heirs to the covenant. We, Christians, replace you Jews as God's chosen people, and the covenant applies to us, not to you. This is explicit in Justin, and this will endure in Christian thought from Justin's time, the second century, down to sometime in the 20th century, and in some Christian circles, into the 21st century. It's the it's Holocaust, more than anything else, that has jarred Christian thinking on this subject. Gee, maybe it wasn't nice, but the way we look at the Jews. This doctrine is called supersessionism, right, from the word supersede. And as I told you the first day of class, if you spell supersede with a C, I'm going to flunk you instantly. Okay? The word supersede does not have a C in it. Right? From Latin, supersedere. Uh, once upon a time, Harvard students knew Latin. Who then is the true Israel? This became a topic of polemic discourse in the high Middle Ages between Jews and Christians, each defending its own truths. And the topic is called Werus Israel, from the Latin phrase, true Israel. Who is the true Israel? In this debate between Jews and Christians of who is the true Israel, which you see in the high Middle Ages, is not a debate about biological continuity. We're not talking here about genetic stock and such, we're obviously talking about theological status. Who has the covenant, right? With whom does God have the covenant? Is it us Jews or is it you Christians? Well, the reverse, us Christians, you Jews, right? This became the topic in the high, in the high Middle Ages. And you have numerous Christian works written in the High Middle Ages on this subject. And in response to them, there are numerous Jewish works, which are anti-Christian polemics to defend Christian Jewish truth claims and to reject Christian truth claims. Here. This is known in the High Middle Ages as Ecclesia and Synagoga. Uh, this became a trope not just in writing, in literary polemics, but also in art, in which we represent Jews versus Christians, Jews versus Christianity. So this is at Notre Dame de Paris. Here we are. We don't have to read the appeal from... Uh, okay. This, these are well represented two types. This over here, of course, is ecclesia, the church. We may say lady church, we might say. And this represents synagogue, or lady synagogue, or Judaism. So here's the church, triumphant, with a crown, looking outward, with a staff. And of course, here is the chalice, or the goblet with the blood of Christ, the same sort of item used in Euchar at the Eucharist. At the Eucharist. Contrasted with her, of course, is Lady Synagoga, right, who is downcast, wearing some kind of funny hat. I assume it's meant to reflect the Jew hat, I assume, from the Middle Ages. Here's a crown, here's a funny hat. She's looking downward, uh, and of course her staff is broken. See, it's cracked right over here. And here she's holding in her hand, so here we have the chalice with Christ's blood, the Eucharist, the atoning power of Christ. Here, of course, we have the law. 
which are here represented as something like the Ten Commandments, right, the two, two tab tablet, tablets of the law. This became a trope in all the Middle Ages. So you go to Notre Dame de Paris, tourist that you are, you'll take lots of pictures, find this on the West Portal. Uh, here you have synagogue against um, uh, synagogue against uh, ecclesia. Here's in Strasbourg, uh, now France, once upon a time Germany, but here you can see exactly the same thing. Here is church, here is synagogue. Again, downcast, all the eyes, broken staff and hand and so on. This becomes a type, a type in the Middle Ages. Uh, Judaism versus Christianity is the conflict between Ecclesia and Synagoga. Okay, next big point. Christians constitute a non-ethnic people, right? Jews aren't ethnos, Christians are not. Christianity has universal claims. In the High Middle Ages, the universal claim of Christianity is represented by the language of extra ecclesiam nulla salus. There is no salvation outside the church. I.e., if you are a non-Christian, you're going to hell. If you are a Christian heretic, you're going to hell. Because you're also outside the church. Right? If your Christianity is not approved of by the bishops and the pope, you're going to hell. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. So this is a universalism of a kind, where Christianity on the one hand says, Christians say, if you're outside the church, there's no salvation, but you can fix that problem by becoming a Christian. Right. We're not uh, jealously uh, preserving this pearl for ourselves. We'll share it. Mm -hmm. You come join the church. Hence, there is a very powerful impulse in Christianity uh, throughout the time, and in some circles to this very day, to missionize. Right? Because after all, we want to share the treasure. We want to share the wealth with everybody. If you believe there is no salvation outside the church, then you're morally obligated to join save people. <coughs> this is the basis of Christian universalism, right? Which claims to be a universal religion. There is, to be fair to Christian thinkers, there is, to be fair, a what's often called a a, um, a universalist strand in Christianity. <coughs> Which I give you here in the small, in the small, uh, in the small print. This goes back to Origen, who had the remarkable idea, remarkable view, that the fires of hell are purgative, not punitive. Even Satan himself will one day be purified. It may take a long time in hell. You know, you've got a lot of burning off to do, but ultimately Satan too will be purified. In other words, even evil will ultimately be won over. And evil will no longer exist. They'll only be good. And if you believe that, well, then I guess it applies to people too. All non-Christians ultimately will be purged of their sins and their guilt, and they will become Christians just willy-nilly, automatically. This is a remarkable view, which has come and gone in history of Christianity, and it persists in some Protestant circles to this very day. But if you believe this view, of course, then you don't really need to save anybody, because they'll be saved anyway, ultimately. Because Christian universalism is expressed this way. It is Augustine who pretty much get, gave the kibosh to this view, who said, if this view be true, then where is the grace of God? Rather, then what does it mean to be a Christian? To go back to the question that uh, Brandon asked. So what advantage do I have? Hey, it's all going to wind up in the same in the end anyway. No, Augustine said. There's got to be some sense here of divine grace, salvation. I mean, you know, you got to, you know, you got to earn it. And if you don't, you're out. That became Christianity. But there is this view, right? Then I give you the, in the brief... Uh, uh, in the small print, you see some of the ideas, the basic terms, apocatastasis. I won't ask you that in the final, don't worry. Right. But it is this remarkable idea. So that's on the Christian side. So Christian universalism is expressed by <clears throat> the idea that, once upon a time, this is the only religion, this is the only way to the Father, is through Christ, through God the Father. Right? There is no salvation outside the church, but we Christians are prepared, and in fact we are, going to go out and conquer the world. Bring Christianity to the world. 
And that's why you have all these missions, and that's why you have Christians in darkest Africa, you know, running medical clinics. We might say the good side is, from our politically correct perspective, is there's a concern for humanity built into Christian thinking. There's a concern for one's other. That's what we Christians have to do. And the Jewish side is a little different. The Jewish side is very much ethnic still. It's peoplehood. It's, in that sense, socially speaking, narrower. And insofar as classical Judaism as it develops in antiquity says Gentiles don't need to convert to Judaism to find favor in God's eyes. All they have to be are law-observant moral people. And that's adequate, sufficient in God's eyes for them to be saved, to use Christian language or Jewish language, to have a share in the world to come. If that be true, then I have no reason to want to send out missionaries to Botswana. People in Botswana, God help them, should take care of themselves. So, this Judaism too has universalist claims, but of course universalist claims are expressed very differently. For there's still a universal God with a universal moral order, but over the history of time, perhaps the <laughs> negative side of it is that Jews have not send out missionaries and open up health clinics in Botswana to help the natives. That's a, tip, that's a more, quote, Christian thing to do than a Jewish thing to do. But of course, on the upside, looking retrospectively, Christians, of course, have, what shall we say, not always been nice to non-Christians. You know, think Middle Ages. Think modern colonialism. Think Holocaust. Think whatever you'd like, right? Uh, Christians are not always treated non-Christians in a very nice way. Whereas I would say the Jewish record is much better. Now, if you're going to say right away, but Professor Cullen, come on, please, 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 not that Jews are better, it's that simply Jews haven't had the opportunity. That may well be true. Over, until very recently, right, Jews have been powerless. So perhaps the vaunted tolerance of rabbinic Judaism is simply a, uh, a moralization of a situation which they couldn't do any, they couldn't control anyway. Since I can't persecute you, I'll say that you're perfectly fine in God's eyes. Christians who didn't have that choice, had the choice rather of what to do. So in one case we have a power group which has treated the other sometimes very nicely, sometimes not nicely at all. In the other case, the Jewish side, we have a group which has always been, relatively speaking, powerless. And has been able to make, I say to, what should we say, to justify its powerlessness by saying, well, Gentiles are fine just as they are anyway, so I can leave them alone, and hopefully they'll leave me alone. Which is the attitude of a powerless minority. So I'm not suggesting Judaism is ipso facto superior in any way. There's a trade-off here. You see, there are different values. One is concern for the other on the Christian side. One is a desire to be left alone, which is a typical attitude of minority groups, and the attitude of, of Jews classically over time. Nowadays, of course, in the post-Holocaust politically correct world, of course, there are Jewish charities which do send doctors to Botswana, right? There are lots of Jewish charities which are concerned with the other, right? And there are many Christians out there who don't want to persecute non-Christians anymore. Yes, so perhaps you will be living in a better world uh, than the world in which I was still born, or in the post-war period, which these changes have not yet happened. So, include, Jews and Christians alike have this dualistic view of the world, Right? Jews, Gentiles, Christians, non Christians, but this manifests itself in social terms in very different ways, classically speaking, over 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 history. All right. Zach just went off to take his final exam. Good luck, Zach. Uh, do you have any questions on this? In other words, I'm sure you do, but uh, so Professor Cohen, what are you saying? You're saying this chosen people idea is not a racial idea at all. Yes, that's one thing I'm saying. You're saying Christians have it as much as Jews have it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? And that how it manifests itself is the key question, not the idea itself, whether you like it or not, but rather how it works. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And like all these complicated things, it's not a simple thing to say it's nice, it's not nice, 
good, it's bad. It's what is it? Whatever it is. But looking over time, this idea has manifested itself or it has had different effects for Jews and Christians over time. Okay. Um, we're about to reach the end. If I have time for one more session, well, if I have time for one more session, I do something on the trial of Jesus. If I have two more sessions, then I would do here a session on sort of reflections and what does this all mean and uh, what do they teach you in Hebrew school or Sunday school and you know how does one take all this material and internalize it if one is going to do that, which I hope you will because this is the kind of stuff that you can do that. You can't do that with organic chemistry, but this you can do. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but alas, we don't have one more session. We only have around another three minutes. Um, but in any case, brief, I hope that the class was not just informative in the sense of teaching you stuff, although we certainly taught a lot of stuff, uh, but it was also a course that will help you think, especially if you are a Jew or a Christian. This would be a lot of material to think about, giving you the other side of the story, which you didn't hear about in Sunday school, we didn't hear about in Hebrew school, this I'm sure of. Uh, and if you're not a Jew or a Christian, I hope you'll understand uh, at least something about what makes Jews and Christians tick, or understand why so many people over time, so many very smart people, have taken this stuff so seriously. And one understands what the issues are uh, here with this material. Um, that this is something in which I'm going to say one can believe in it. But rather, the language I'd say is one can take it seriously, because these are serious questions, serious concerns we've addressed from the beginning of the course uh, until now. So if you've gotten some better appreciation of that, uh, then I will say, Dayenu, right? I am content with my lot, or right, it, is sufficient. it is sufficient for me. And if you got more out of it than that, then of course, I'm even more delighted. <coughs> so please give me your feedback uh, on the Q Guide, and I think that's it.